we were uh, doing the stomach, and I had yet to talk about this stuff. This is the last part of the stomach section, right? This is where we ended? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so this figure demonstrates or indicates how gastric activity is regulated. Now, actually, in the book, the title of this um, figure says, I think, gastric secretion or something like that. But really, it applies to both the secretions of the gastric juices and the activity of gastric uh, musculature. Um, so there are three parts of how we regulate um, gastric activity. Um, can we see these? Uh, kind of getting caught up on the end here, but uh, the top part is the cephalic phase, referring to what takes place based in the head, um, or really the brain, of course. Um, and then the gastric phase, which is how the stomach regulates itself, and the intestinal phase, which is how the intestines regulate what the stomach is sending to them. Um, Let me zoom in on this. Uh, so with the cephalic phase, basically this is preparing you to digest food that you're eating. So um, seeing or thinking about food, which are both going to uh, be very conscious um, level processing, higher processing in the cerebral cortex, and then stimulation of the olfactory and gustatory senses, which feed directly into the hypothalamus and amygdala, any of that stuff is going to lead to stimulation of the vagus nerve, which will increase secretions of the gastric juices and increase contraction of the uh, musculature, muscularis of the stomach. It's basically getting at if you are about to eat or you're eating, then the cues from that food are going to uh, stimulate the stomach to start being active and be prepared for the food as it arrives. Um, if you're eating something, obviously, then your taste receptor is going to be activated. Um, eating also involves smell, although you can smell food as it's being prepared or it's nearby. Um, and then seeing food, uh, presumably if you're seeing food, it's because you're preparing it. Now, uh, some of this is really in the context of uh, sort of early ancestral man. Uh, and so if food was present, they were probably eating it. Um, they, of course, didn't have televisions and commercials and seeing pictures of food um, <clears throat> in non-meal situations. But because our brain is ba basically set up for uh, <clears throat> activation of the stomach in preparation of food that's in front of us or that we're about to eat, we've, uh, as a society, seen a rise of taking advantage of this. Just if you're watching television and you see a commercial come on about, I don't know, uh, uh, a pizza commercial comes on and the, the cheese just dripping off of the top of it and coming out of the uh, crust and all those weird things they're doing to pizzas today. Um, <clears throat> gets you thinking about the food and then your stomach starts to growl and all that and we interpret that to mean that we're hungry. Actually all it is is that we have this hardwired relationship that when our brain is processing information about food, our stomach starts becoming active in anticipation of the food. But Marketing takes advantage of this to make us want to go find food when we see advertisements. Or if you walk across campus this way and you get to the corner over there and you cross over, you'll go by the Pizza Hut, Pizza Hut, uh, Burger King, and apparently I'm really thinking about pizza for lunch today. <laughs> um, and they pipe out the smells of what they're cooking. So as you're walking by, the olfactory stimulation will uh, activate the stomach and you'll say, oh, I'm hungry because I can feel my stomach growling or something like that. And really it's not a direct sign of hunger, it's just a sign of activity of the stomach. 
Um, all of that is increasing activity uh, of the stomach. You can also decrease activity of the stomach under certain situations. Um, they have lice, loss of appetite and depression here, kind of uh, not a, a very, uh, <clears throat> I don't know, complete way of describing it, but there are various reasons why um, you might not be hungry. So you might have just gorged yourself and you're like, oh, I just can't do anymore. I don't want to touch food anymore. And you're higher processes you're saying I'm not going to eat anything for a while um, or you might have some negative association with food or certain foods at least um, my uh, um, father's wife my stepmother uh, <clears throat> apparently was forced to eat broccoli when she was a kid before she could like leave the table or something like that so she has a very negative opinion about broccoli however my father and I when uh, he was between wives. Um, we lived together, sort of, you know, two single guys hanging out. Um, and he loves to cook, so we would cook dinner all the time. And one of the rituals involved in that was uh, we usually have broccoli with a cheese sauce over that sort of thing. So when I came back to uh, visit when I was off at college and graduate school, uh, one of the things that we like to do is to sort of revisit that. Uh, nostalgia of him making dinner for me and so broccoli was usually involved in that and my stepmother had to leave the house while he was cooking the broccoli because it's just so repulsive to her so there can be negative associations with food that you learn from whatever experiences you have and they're therefore your cerebral cortex will actually decrease activity of your autonomic system control of the stomach okay. now in gastric the gastric phase, this is essentially the stomach reacting to the fact that there's food present. And the more food that you have in your stomach, then obviously the more active your stomach has to be to digest that food. And so stomach distension activates stretch receptors. Is just talking about as you cram more and more food into your stomach, it's going to stretch out. And that actually increases the activity um, of the stomach because if there's food there, then obviously you have to digest it. Now, it refers here to vagal reflexes, um, which is technically not really what should be at this point right here. Uh, vagal vagal just means that there's sensory input going through the vagus nerve up to the brain, and uh, vagus fibers coming down from the brain increasing activity. So just the, the fibers are tra uh, traveling up and down the vagus nerves, all the vagal vagal is referring to. But, that does really mean, and obviously it says uh, uh, it involves the medulla, that's involving cephalic structures. So it's technically not really part of the um, gastric phase, except that it's originating out of the gastric lining. Uh, more importantly, there are local reflexes. So within the plexuses of the uh, line of the stomach, the submucosal and the myenteric plexuses, there are direct connections from the stretch receptors to uh, neurons that control stomach activity. Those are local reflexes. They don't really need the medulla involved, but it's there's going to be a parallel set, a bit of information sent up to the brain for that. So this is the um, nervous system or autonomic control of what's going on. And then this is more of the second part of this, the food chemicals and rising pH is going to activate hormones that regulate activity. So there are chemoreceptors in the lining of the stomach that are sensitive to pH and to particular macromolecules, namely nutrient molecules. And as those levels change, then the um, stomach is going to release more gastrin from the G cells or the enteroendocrine cells that were mentioned last time. I think there's a typo here. It says food chemicals and rising pH activate. Um, oh, is activate tumor receptors. That does quite make sense. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Activate tumor receptors, which causes G cells to release gastrin. I think it's supposed to say, I guess, decreasing pH. What they're talking about is as your stomach acidity goes up, meaning that your stomach is active and it's secreting uh, its acid, 
that should be a signal to the stomach to be more active and digest that food that's there. Uh, so I think when they say rising pH, they sort of meant rising acidity, which would be lowering pH. Now, um, there is an inhibitory part to this, just like the uh, higher centers of your brain can decrease activity. In the stomach, what's uh, doing that is the acidity. And I, part of the reason why this rising pH typo here uh, makes sense is because then they say when a, we have a really low pH, there's going to be a decrease in gastric secretion. So they must be saying, well, if this is low pH deep, uh, inhibiting activity, then the high pH must increase it. That makes sense. But uh, really what it is is as your stomach pH goes down, because you have food there, the stomach's going to be more active to digest that food. And it's when the acidity gets very extreme, which can cause problems in the lining of your stomach, that the stomach is going to just sort of say, whoa, back off. We need to calm down a little bit. Uh, and less gastrin will mean less acid secreted from those gastric glands we talked about. So this is just keeping things in check when the acidity gets too extreme. And then they put emotional distress here. Um, which I don't think is entirely appropriate within the idea of the gastric phase because they're talking about sympathetic and parasympathetic controls, which is really um, cephalic and goes into that loss of appetite depression thing that they had before. I think the reason they put it here is when you're in fight or flight mode or just sympathetic activity for whatever reason, you're anxious or excited or something like that. Uh, along with that, the sympathetic fibers that go to the myenteric plexus, sorry, no. The sympathetic fibers that go into the lining of the stomach are going to override the parasympathetic controls. I was about to say that they're going to inhibit the parasympathetic cells in the plexus, but that's not true because those would be post-sympathetic, sorry, post-ganglionic sympathetic fibers which would go directly to the glands and make the glands be less active and go to the stomach muscles and decrease the movement of food through the stomach. So it would override what the parasympathetic system is doing by competing with it. Um, so that's happening within the wall of the stomach, but ultimately it's caused by the autonomic system's descending input from uh, the central nervous system. So putting it here in the gastric phase is a little bit off, but I think it's they're pointing out that some of that's happening in the lining of the stomach. Yeah. So is that gastric phase, the blue part, is that where you, like, you throw up? No, it's just decreasing stomach activity. So all of these, the red arrow is increasing production of gastric juices and contraction of the muscles and the wall of the, the stomach, and the blue, teal, whatever color box there is the opposite, where it's decreasing secretions and uh, inhibiting the contraction of those muscles. So uh, what you're talking about would be um, uh, increasing contraction of the muscles, but making them contract in the opposite direction, so it would push food out of the stomach. Um, and that's not what this is addressing. Um, <clears throat> there are chemoreceptors in the stomach and in the duodenum, actually, that when you're exposed to certain toxic chemicals, they will reflexively cause you to uh, vomit by reverse peristalsis, pushing things back out from the stomach. But that's not what this is getting at. But that's a good point to um, ask about. Uh, then we have the intestinal phase. And so um, this is really the duodenum paying attention to what's coming out of the stomach and regulating what the stomach does. At the basis of this is that the duodenum can't stretch out to take in all of the volume of the stomach. And the more active the stomach is, the more food it's going to pass through the pylorus to the duodenum. And so uh, part of what the main thing that's going on in an intestinal phase is actually slowing down the stomach. So uh, the uh, <clears throat> inhibitory part is much larger in this than what's in the stomach. 
Um, so in the duodenum, there are sensors, chemoreceptors, uh, looking at pH of what's coming in and the presence of nutrient macromolecules. Um, the, as a lower pH comes in, and by lower I just mean less than the neutral that's normally present there, and partially digestive foods come along, then uh, the intestines release their own version of gastrin, which has the same effect as gastrin released in the stomach to increase activity. That's actually a minor part of what it does, because as soon as those signals start to increase, as well as the duodenum wall starts to stretch out, then there are uh, <coughs> neural uh, nervous system components that decrease <coughs> gastric activity um, so that less food is coming in at, at any given time. And uh, there are hormones that are released that have the same effect. So, um, yeah, I think it was in the gastric phase in the, the arrow, it had um, nervous and endocrine components of that, and they've done that again here, uh, just separating them out. But they essentially do the same thing, which is to limit the amount of stuff coming down the pipe, so to speak. Um, so if we back out to this for a second. Uh, these three components, the, gas, uh, the cephalic, gastric, and intestinal phases, are all regulating what's going on with the stomach. The cephalic and gastric components are largely increasing gastric activity, and the intestinal is largely decreasing it. Now there are excitatory and inhibitory, if you want to call them that, components to each. The red arrow is increasing activity, the blue, green, whatever color box is decreasing activity. It's just that from the cephalic phase, it's mostly increasing things. There is a little bit of decrease that can come from the cephalic phase under certain conditions. And in the gastric phase, it's mostly increasing activity, although there is especially this one uh, extreme acidity feedback that slows things down. <clears throat> But then in the intestinal phase, most of the activity is decreasing gastric activity. Most of the signals are decreasing act gastric activity. Um, although when food starts to come in, the intestines will release their own gastrin to complement the, the gastrin from the stomach. Uh, but that's actually kind of minor for the uh, intestinal phase. Mostly the intestine is saying, don't give us too much food at once, we can't handle it. So this kind of illustrates how um, the stomach is regulating itself. Which then brings us on now to the intestines. Now in the intestine section, I only really want to highlight a couple of things. Um, first off, the uh, Small intestine is where we absorb most of the nutrients that we take in. And so um, to maximize um, absorption of nutrients, the small intestine uh, uh, increases its surface area as much as possible. There are four ways that it does this. I just want to highlight this. Now the book doesn't exactly lay things out this way. Um, in fact, the four things I'm about to list, the first one they don't really quite mention, I think because it's so seemingly self-evident. And then the second, third, and fourth things I'm going to list, they actually have a figure for those three in order. So, um, <clears throat> so let me just pull those up. Um, <clears throat> this is a small intestine. Uh, I'm sorry, the words are cut off a little bit at the edge. Um, this computer monitor is not perfect, but um, uh, the small intestine starts here at the duodenum where it connects to the stomach, 
the duodenum is about 15 or so centimeters long, maybe 20. Um, and then we shift into the jejunum, which makes up the rest of the first half of the small intestine. And then the second half of the small intestine is the ileum. Um, and it's just one long tube that keeps sort of folding back and forth, trying to fit as much into the space that we have as possible. Which highlights the first way that it increases surface area, which is just in the sense of length. If we look at the small intestine, the starting point of the small intestine here, at the beginning of the duodenum, to the end of the small intestine where it meets up with the uh, cecum of the large intestine. Um, from the start to the end, a straight line would probably only be maybe 20 or so centimeters long. However, the tube is much longer than that because it's fitting as much of the organ in as possible. Okay. So just uh, its length increases the surface area quite a bit. Now surface area is just, of a uh, surface area inside of a tube is just the length of that tube times its circumference. Okay, So if we cut the tube open and lay it out flat, we have the width of uh, the tube is the same as what was its circumference. And then the length uh, <coughs> is this, the other dimension we multiply that by to get the area. If we have a straight flat tube from point A to point B that's only 20 centimeters long, versus a tube that goes from point A and all over the place in your intestines, uh, I mean in your abdomen, to get to point B, then the length is just going to really increase that surface area quite a bit. Um, now, uh, uh, I can't, actually I was going to try to type this up on the board for the sake of the recording, but it won't work because I have limited stuff I can type up there. Um, so, if we're talking about 20 centimeters in length, going from the beginning to the end in a straight line, and we multiply that by the circumference, does anybody remember the uh, um, formula for getting the circumference of a circle? Yeah, so uh, what is, okay, pi, and then 2 pi r is the way it's usually said, but really what is 2 times r? No, that's r times r. Two. Right. Two radii is one diameter. So if we know how wide the tube is, and the average diameter of the small intestine is about two and a half centimeters, that times pi is the um, <coughs> circumference. So two and a half centimeters times pi. Um, looks like a pi. Uh, <coughs> And if you calculate that out, if I remember correctly, it's about 150 centimeters, 150 centimeters squared. Okay. Um, but if we actually measure the beginning to the end of the small intestine laid out straight, if we can uncoil it all, um, exactly what that length is is a little bit, uh, <clears throat> well, there is a paper that came out recently that not recently, but in the past couple of years, that suggested all of the estimates for the length of the small intestine were off, and explaining why they said that. Um, so uh, the numbers I'm about to use might not be perfectly on point, but um, <clears throat> I think the uh, general length is thought to be about... Uh, I think it's between six and seven meters or something like that. So let's call it six meters, 600 centimeters times 2.5 centimeters time. Um, oh, shoot, I forget what this comes out to be. Uh, 12, that must be about, nope. Oh, shoot. I, I had these numbers memorized, I thought, so I would be able to do this in lecture, but I've forgotten. So, um, calculator. So, 600 times 2.5 times 3.5. Not at all the number I was about to say. Okay. Uh, so, about, um, I got 4,700 centimeters squared. 
So just that increase in length there, not going directly from point A to point B, but rather having it bend all inside, that change in length means that the surface area increases, increases quite a bit. So we have far more cells available to absorb the nutrients in. Okay. Then the next component of how this changes is uh, circular folds. which um, this figure actually shows all three of the uh, second, third, and fourth part of the line here. So circular folds are just on the inside lining. Um, the mucosa is just folded up uh, <clears throat> along its line. It's kind of like the rugi in the stomach, just this, the mucosa is folded up over itself, um, except that these don't stretch out. So in the stomach, when the stomach's filling, they stretch out, but here they don't stretch out. Um, so it's sort of scrunching up the inner surface of this, the tube by quite a bit. Now, if we took this line that goes around, actually, illustrate this way. Nobody's ever erased this port since I did the immune system. Um, all right. So if this goes like that, fitting up into that much space, we could take that line I just drew and stretch it out flat. I have no idea if that's actually how long it is, but imagine I just grab the two ends of this line and stretch it out. That therefore increases the length of the mucosa inside because it's all scrunched up with these circular folds. <laughs> Um, I have no idea what actual uh, <clears throat> change in length that is, so we're just going to pretend that it's about uh, five times longer, let's say, which would increase this, oh, five is just too much math to do in my head on that. Let's call it ten times longer, which makes this, uh, with the circular folds, <clears throat> 47,000 centimeters squared, just increasing that by a factor of ten. The next component, which is actually the center part of this picture, are villi. Um, villus is singular for that. Um, and villi are just finger-like extensions in the mucosal epithelium, or in the mucosa, that the epithelium is wrapped around. So there's this finger-like extension that has an epithelium wrapped around it, these pictures are, uh, of course, two-dimensional, so it's just suggesting that it's wrapped around the um, outline of the finger. But really, it's wrapped all the way around this finger-like extension. There are a bunch of villi sticking out. If we can look at this sort of cut-open version with the circular folds in a real um, small intestine, it would have kind of a velvety inner surface because all these villi, which are really, really small, look like, you know, a very, very fine uh, shag carpet on the inside surface there, yeah, or like the, the texture of velvet. So those are all over the inside here. Um, if we went from this point here straight across to this point at the base of the um, villus, we'd have, let's say, 50 cells across from there to there, straight across. But instead, we go way up here, way down here, and that's happening in three dimensions. And so we're going from maybe a line of 50 cells across to a line of 200, 300 cells all the way up and over the thing. So increasing things quite a bit. Again, I'm making up these numbers, and I'm trying to make it easy math. So let's say that increases the uh, <coughs> surface area of the small intestine, again, by a factor of 10, which might not be true, but it's really easy for me to do this on the board. Um, so now we've gone uh, a straight flat tube of 20 centimeters long was 150 centimeters. Uh, the length increased, a conservative estimate of what that length is, got us up to 4,700 centimeters squared. The circular folds got us to 47,000 centimeters squared. 
the um, villi got us up to 470,000 centimeters squared. And then the last part of this are microvilli, which, whoops, which obviously is just very, very small versions of the villi. And that's what the third part of this picture is showing. Um, the apical surface of these cells, the membrane that makes up the actual absorptive surface, is um, has its own little villi in it, microvilli, because they're extensions of the cell membrane that's taking up. Uh, at the bottom here we have micrographs. The first two are light micrographs showing us the circular folds and the villi as uh, maybe uh, 4x objective type magnification and 10x or 40x objective type magnification. Here with the microvilla, we're looking at an electron micrograph. So this is going to be um, thousands, if not tens of thousands of uh, times magnification looking at the top of the cell. And the cell membrane is just, again, wrapped around these things. And we're looking at it in two dimensions. Keep in mind that the villi and the microvilli are three-dimensional, so it's wrapping around quite a bit. And again, making up these numbers, well, let's say that that increases the surface area by a factor of 10 again. So now we're up to almost 5 million square centimeters with all of these different methods of increasing surface area. Um, <clears throat> The numbers I'm using are completely made up, except for the average length and the uh, average diameter of this small intestine. Uh, but the factors of uh, increase that I'm putting in here are not at all necessarily correct, but it does show you that we can make a pretty impressive increase here. Now, um, I did say before that there's some people that are suggesting that the numbers that we're used to thinking about for the surface area of the small intestine were misestimated or something like that. Um, but it's really not a significant change. Um, most sources that will talk about the small intestine length being six to seven meters uh, will end up with the small intestine surface area being the equivalent of pretty much a um, uh, tennis court, I think is the, the metaphor they usually use. Um, or similar. And the people that suggested the numbers were wrong still said it's pretty big, and they said maybe it's only about a half of a uh, tennis court in size. But whatever it is, it's a huge surface. And, you know, it might be the surface area of the floor in this room is all folded up and stuck inside of your abdomen so that you can absorb nutrients through all of the cells that would make up that surface. Whatever it is, it's a lot a huge increase in surface area and maximizing the ability to absorb things across it. So um, that was something I wanted to um, point out here rather than going through the, the basic anatomy and histolo histology stuff just to point out that the reason for that is really to increase that surface area. and. Under this figure here, they describe what circular folds, villi, and microvilli are. They don't even have anything in here talking about the length per se, although it's definitely there. It just seems so self-evident when you look at the intestines or this tube that's all folded inside of your uh, abdom abdominal cavity. So kind of, I think it's often getting kind of overlooked there. Um, So they mentioned a few other things. One other thing that I want to mention about the small intestine uh, has to do with the mechanical digestion and the propulsion that takes place in it. Now, the mechanical digestion that takes place in the small intestine, which is a physical mixing of food, is called seg segmentation. So circular fibers pinch off along the length of the small intestine at regular intervals, making segments uh, that contain, each contain their own little bolus of the food that you're digesting. Those circular fibers can uh, relax and the circular fibers in the middle of each segment contract, sort of shifting all of the um, segments along. 
half of what's in one segment gets squeezed to one side when the next. Okay, so we start off the circular fiber is pinching off when we have a segment here. Then these relax, and the circular fiber in the middle pinches off, squishing half of what's in this segment this way and half of it in the other direction. So here we have segments that are representing half of the two alternating colors in the first version. And then it shifts back and we pinch off in the middle of the segments. And then that squeezes part of this mixed uh, segment into this mixed segment, part of this mixed segment. And we end up with a different um, color there, just representing that we're completely mixing the food up. This is the mechanical digestion part of what's going on here. What's also going on here, which is kind of hard to illustrate in a picture like this, is propulsion. And that propulsion is peristalsis, essentially. It's just happening on top of the segmentation. So the circular fibers that are pinching off and seeming to just uh, alternate back and forth uh, in the segments here are actually slowly moving all along and pushing the food uh, through the small intestine. And at the same time, mixing everything up through this segmentation. Um, it talks a little bit about the chemical digestion of the small intestine, the, the whole spiel I did about um, enzymes at the beginning of all of this kind of touched on all of that. Uh, and then it introduces the large intestine, um, which I'm really not going to talk about at all because mostly what's in here is just um, the anatomy of the structure. So you can get that from the reading directly. Uh, there's a histology picture of this too. Um, something they point out in this histology picture, uh, and for unknown reasons, they just kind of overlook it in the other ones. Um, there's a special type of cell called a goblet cell. Um, the drawing they have representing the goblet cell here it doesn't quite meet my expectation of what it really looks like. but. I don't have any data of what it really looks like outside of my own imagination. Um, but this is a cell that's making a very watery mucus. And in the apical region of that cell is going to be a huge vacuole, mostly filled with water, which therefore does not pick up any stain. So when you look at the stained tissue, half of the cell is this big water droplet. And so it looks like a goblet. That's where it got its name. Goblet cells are not unique to the large intestine. It's just sort of they're talked about in the large intestine because they seem to be a very big component of what's going on there. Um, but goblet cells are found in the line of the small intestine also. Um, I don't think they're in the stomach per se because the stomach has specialized cells for making the mucus that includes buffering components to offset the stomach acid stuff. But in the, the intestines, there are goblet cells that go along that line. And they're just very prominent and easy to pick out in micrographs of the large intestine. So they point them out here. Um, now, sort of the last process in all of this, so at the beginning I said there was digestion, propulsion, absorption, secretion, uh, and elimination, I think I might have called it. Um, the elimination of the indigestible material from our food um, is defecation. What's happening in defecation is, I don't think there's a picture down here. No. Um, let me go back up to this picture here. Um, what's happening in defecation is as the food stuff's moving through the large intestine, we're pulling the last bit of water out that we can, and what we have there, the indigestible stuff, ends up being the feces that we're going um, expel. When they get to the rectum, that's sort of where we keep the, uh, keep that stuff um, until we're ready to eliminate it from our body. And stretch receptors in the line of the rectum will signal through the sacral spinal cord that uh, the waste products are building up. The parasympathetic system will respond to that by causing contraction of muscles and relaxation of a sphincter muscle. So we can expel the feces out of our rectum and through the anus. 
Um, there is an internal sphincter, the internal anal sphincter, uh, which is smooth muscle and uh, it constricts when we don't want to uh, avoid our rectum and it relaxes when we do. However, we might not be in a socially acceptable place to do that, so we have an external anal sphincter, which is skeletal muscle, and that skeletal muscle is under voluntary control so that uh, if we don't want to um, defecate, we have control over that. Um, a large part of Freudian psychoanalytics is based on that. You've heard of anal retentive people and that it's... Uh, <coughs> I don't necessarily give a whole lot of credence to it, but the idea is when you're learning to control your bowels, uh, some people get an undue amount of pleasure out of having that much control over their body and they become control freaks. Okay? That's the idea behind sort of Freudian anal retentiveness. Freud's kind of a weird thing. He was coked up all the time, it's okay. Um, <laughs> I might be overstating that, but he did have a, a cocaine habit. <laughs> That time in history, cocaine was not an illicit drug necessarily. But um, so uh, <clears throat> there's this reflexive uh, ex uh, sorry elimination of feces, which we have voluntary control over a sphincter to keep that from happening um, uh, in at inappropriate times. Presumably, if our colon was just completely filled with feces because we've been denying ourselves to, to avoid it for a long time, for whatever reason, that I would imagine at some point there'd have to be some sort of override to force uh, the elimination of the feces. I'm not familiar with that because it's just not likely to happen. Um, however, uh, in the urinary system, uh, how Voiding the bladder is controlled is very similar, and there definitely is an override from that. The parasympathetic system can override our voluntary control of the external urethral sphincter because we don't want urine backing up into the kidneys causing problems. Um, <clears throat> presumably, we wouldn't want feces backing up in our large intestine, but I think that the pain of uh, that and the threat of... Um, the large intestine bacteria spilling out would override things just the same. So I don't know if there's necessarily a parasympathetic override for the external anal sphincter, but um, there must be something like that, similar to the urinary system. So, um, so that finishes up this section on the intestines. I just wanted to highlight the idea of increased surface area of the small intestine, uh, the mechanical digestion of the small intestine, and just uh, introduce the large intestine and highlight the defecation reflex. The next section of the book is about the accessory organs <clears throat> and really just about the liver, pancreas, and gallbladder. Um, I've been noticing this in the book. Uh, they write gallbladder as if it's a single word. I've never known it to be ever written as a single word because the gall bladder. Gall is just another name for bile. Um, so just to mention, I'm used to it being two words. Uh, it seems more appropriate that way. But um, another weird thing about the book here is I would put the liver and the gallbladder next to each other in this list just because they're related. Um, the order that we see in here is the order that the book deals with them. So it introduces what the liver is and what bile is, and then it goes to the pancreas, and then it comes back to the gallbladder that stores that bile. This seems like a weird way of putting things together. Um, of course, there are other accessory organs. There are the salivary glands. They're not dealt with here. These are the organs that are attached to the duodenum, um, and they produce digestive juices that help the small intestine digest what's coming down the pipe. <laughs> Um, yeah. This picture, well, let me, let me make it a little bit larger. Let's see. Um, the pancreas and the small intestine, I mean, the pancreas attached to the small intestine here, and the ducts coming from the liver and gallbladder attached there also. So, right about here is where, this right about here is where those juices are. Uh, 
uh, enter into the small intestine. Um, there's a common entry point there. It has a little sphincter-like muscle to uh, keep that area closed when we aren't eating food, when we're between meals. Um, and uh, I'll talk a little bit about how that affects the storage of bile. Um, but there's sort of a, there's a common entry point there. Yeah. Now the liver is a huge organ, which uh, unusual compared to a lot of or other organs, has a very simple, repeating, homogenous structure to it. Um, it's made up of these little repeating hexagonal structures called lobules. Um, at the six points around the hexagon, there are a few um, tubes coming in, uh, or tubes marking those corners. And then right in the middle is another tube. Uh, I'm using the word tube because I can't call them vessels. One of them is a duct. Um, and I can't call them veins or arteries necessarily because there's a vein and an artery both together at the hexagonal corners. Um, blood coming from the digestive tract is going to get into the blood to the liver through the hepatic portal vein. And branches of that hepatic portal vein go to all of these little lobules. And uh, fresh oxygenated blood is going to come into the liver through the hepatic artery and branches off the hepatic artery go to each of these corners. So coming to this hexagonal structure at each corner are two vessels, both carrying blood into the structure. There's branches off the hepatic portal vein carrying blood from the digestive tract, uh, <laughs> containing what we've absorbed through, from the digestive system. Um, and the branches off the hepatic artery bringing fresh blood in. So that fresh blood and the blood coming from the digestive tract mixes together and filters through the hepatic lobule, essentially through sinusoidal capillaries, although some sources won't even mention them as capillaries because there's the walls are so incomplete. Everything can filter through here. Uh, and it goes to the vein in the middle of the hexagonal structure, which eventually leads to the hepatic vein carrying blood out of the liver. All of that blood coming in, whether it's fresh blood uh, that's just been oxygenated or the used blood from the digestive tract, filters through this. And we pull out toxins that we've absorbed. We pull out nutrients that the livers need um, under the uh, activity of insulin. Uh, glucose is pulled out and stored in the liver as um, glycogen, those sorts of things. Um, and the liver does a bunch of different things in filtering the blood. Some of them are kind of lymphatic-like uh, functions. Some of them have to do with digestion. Some of them have to do with uh, other functions of the liver. And then eventually all of that blood drains out. Now, the other thing that's in the structure, what's green in this picture, is about bile production. So cells in the liver make bile. Bile is the emulsifying agent that helps to separate lipid molecules so that the enzymes that break down lipids can get in and do their job. Um, one of the things that we've talked about that's a component of bile is a repurposed version of the heme molecule that's called bilirubin. Uh, bilirubin is a component of bile along with other things that help to break the lipid molecules apart so that enzymes can get in there and break them down. And it, as long as what, it, along with many of the other components of bile, are not changed in that process. So the bile gets into the small intestine, does its job emulsifying the fats that we've eaten, and then gets reabsorbed and goes back to the liver, and the liver recycles it to use it again. Um, and so as the blood from the hepatic portal vein is filtering through, some components of bile that have been reabsorbed will pass through and they'll get reclaimed and go back into the small intestine through the bile duct, this uh, recycled component of the bile. Um, and so this picture, the inset up above, is just sort of suggesting how 
this hexagonal structure of a lobule just repeats over and over again throughout the whole liver. Okay. We don't see the hexagonal structure if we look at it with the naked eye, but we can see it under the microscope, and it just repeats over and over again. Uh, and that's all the liver is, that structure. Um, now, I'll come it back to the pancreas in just a second because uh, I want to finish talking about bile. Um, so all of the bile that's made in the liver is going to drain out from the left side to the right side of the liver through the right or left hepatic ducts, which come together in the common hepatic duct, which then feeds into the common bile duct, uh, which is what we call it after we pass where the gallbladder is attached. The common bile duct then is going to eventually attach to the small intestine along with the uh, pancreas. And I'll show you that. It's in the pancreas. Uh, but I'll show you that in a second. If we need bile, the opening to that will be relaxed and the bile will come out and get in the small intestine. But between meals, there's a sphincter-like smooth muscle that closes off that opening, and we don't pass bile into the small intestine when we don't need it. And so it backs up in the common bile duct, and it backfills into the cystic duct going to the gallbladder. And we store the bile in the gallbladder in between meals. Um, when, we need gallbladder, when we need bile from the gallbladder, there's a signal that specifically tells it to be released um, at the beginning of each meal which I'll show you in a second. So let me go back up here to the pancreas first to show you where the common bile duct attaches. So here in green is the common bile duct and the pancreatic duct merges with it and they both open up to the small intestine at the same place. Um, the pancreatic duct actually has a branch coming off of it called the accessory pancreatic duct, which is not labeled here, but uh, it has its own opening. There are situations where the pancreas needs to release things into the small intestine, even though the gallbladder and liver aren't going to be releasing any bile. So it needs a second way to do that. But the main uh, pancreatic duct is coming in here with the um, common bile duct. We've looked at the pancreas already under the microscope. I'm not going to talk about it a whole lot. We looked at it before concentrating on the pancreatic islets, where insulin and glucagon are made, uh, helping to regulate blood glucose levels. The rest of the tissue, the majority of the tissue, which stains much darker than the pancreatic islets, are made up of cells that are producing mostly enzymes that are going to be secreted into the pancreatic duct and carried along. That's an exocrine function, secreting out through a duct, as opposed to endocrine function, where hormones are secreted into the bloodstream directly. Um, I don't know if this is necessarily true, and whether it is or not doesn't really make a big difference, but I think the little clusters of cells as we see them, kind of like little rosettes in this picture, I would imagine, just knowing how a lot of things work in the body, that each little cluster probably makes one enzyme. Uh, so it's not like these cells are just turning out a bunch of enzymes, but the ones that make uh, uh, certain, like the pancreatic amylase, come from one cluster cells, and um, chymotrypsin, which is a protease that comes from the um, pancreas, is made in another place. And there's just a number of different uh, enzymes, and they're probably all made by the different clusters here. I don't know if that's true, but it would make sense with the way that certain other things work in the body, too. Um, and so all that gets secreted out. The pancreas also makes bicarbonate, which we've already met, helps to neutralize the pH and the plasma of the blood. The bicarbonate made in the pancreas, however, is helping to neutralize the stomach acid in the small intestine. And that's partly why there's an accessory pancreatic duct. Sometimes stomach acid gets into the small intestine, uh, not necessarily because we have food, but we're, we're swallowing other things um, all the time. And so if some of that gets into the duodenum, we need to neutralize it. So there's the accessory pancreatic duct, so the pancreas can secrete that um, bicarbonate to help out. Um, 
Now, in this section, they don't address um, control of these structures so much, but I do want to talk about that a little bit. Um, there are a couple of hormones that help control um, oops, uh, release of those digestive juices from the pancreas and the gallbladder. One of them is called cholecystokinin. The chole part of this word, and this word is from Greek, chole in Greek means bile. And then cyst or cysto in Greek means bladder or fluid filled space. And then kine is the root of a word like kinetic. Uh, it's also the root of the word cinema with a K changing to a C. And it means moving. So literally, cholecystokinin means uh, bile bladder movement or uh, the gallbladder contracting. So cholecystokinin is named for the fact that it causes the gallbladder to contract. Um, we will actually refer to cholecystokinin just by its abbreviation, which is CCK. But I want to talk about what the name means because it literally tells you that it causes the gallbladder to contract. But actually, and I've got to write this up on the board because there's no way to do it on the screen. Um, cholecystokinin and secretin, uh, the two hormones that I want to talk about, um, <clears throat> contribute to controlling the pancreas and the liver slash gallbladder. Um, <clears throat> So let me just set up a little table here to talk about it. Um, so CCK and secretin each have their respective effects on the gallbladder, uh, liver slash gallbladder, and the pancreas. Now, I've left a little space here under each one because uh, the duodenum releases these two hormones in response to um, certain cues, certain chemicals that are released. Um, CCK is released in response to uh, what's called hypertonic kind. Now, chyme, I hope I mentioned this last time, is the word we use to describe the liquefied food that's the contents of the stomach. So as that moves out of the stomach in the large intestine, small intestine, um, depending on how much is dissolved in that. So if we have a lot of food that we've digested in the, food, in the stomach, the chyme is going to be chock full of all of these nutrient molecules. So it's going to be hypertonic, which is basically the more food stuff that's coming in, the more CCK that you release. Um, and I just told you CCK causes contraction of the gallbladder. That's what its name is. Now in that hypertonic chyme, there's going to be lipids. So you need as much bile as possible right at the beginning uh, when you start to process a meal to um, uh, Emulsify those lipids. Okay. Also, with the hypertonic chymes, you have all those macromolecules, you need enzymes to break those down. And so CCK tells the pancreas to secrete um, enzyme rich digestive juices. Um, <clears throat> And then secretin, which is probably the least imaginative name for anything in the world, um, is released in response to a low pH of what's coming in from the stomach. What we want to do in response to a low pH is to neutralize that acid. 
And remember, low pH means high acidity. So secretin tells the liver to make more bile. which contains some buffering agents in it. And it tells the pancreas to secrete a bicarbonate-rich digestive juices. Um, now, for the most part, stuff coming out of your stomach is going to contain a mixture of acid and uh, nutrient macromolecules. So you're going to be releasing CCK and secretin all the time when your food's entering into the duodenum. Just the amount that's released is dependent on the particular cues there. And that's going to regulate how much of the liver slash gallbladder and pancreas do their jobs. Um, but this is a, a brief kind of overview of how these two uh, main hormones work on this stuff, and they regulate what's going on in that system. <clears throat> so, um, the book doesn't actually touch on that so much. It mentions these hormones elsewhere, but I just wanted to highlight it in terms of the um, uh, accessory organs. So, um, the next part in the chapter goes on to discuss uh, chemical uh, Digestion, yeah, that's the way they say it, which is the enzymes. And I talked about that at the beginning of the whole story. Um, so the table that shows the different enzymes that I, I think I pointed out to you um, back at the beginning is in this part of the chapter. And then it also talks a little bit about absorption. Now, there aren't great pictures for absorption in the book, so I'm not going to actually go there to show it. But what the heck, I will, just because otherwise there's a gallbladder on the screen. Um, so this is sort of an overview picture of what's happening, both absorption and digestion, uh, secretion. And then here are all of the uh, hormone, uh, sorry, enzymes, which I talked about earlier in this. Um, <clears throat> a breakdown, I don't really care for these pictures, sort of what's, how, um, Carbohydrates are digested, um, how proteins are digested, how lipids are digested, how nucleic acids are digested. And they don't even have figures for all of that. Um, really what I'd like to um, see them do is, where's that picture? Uh, is take a picture like this and represent how we absorb all three of the nutrient macromolecules. So this is just showing us how we absorb um, lipids. Lipids being lipids can dissolve through the lipids of the cell membrane easily. So they're just absorbed directly into the cell through simple diffusion. They're processed within the cell, being lipids, uh, to be paired with certain proteins making up these structures called chylomicrons. Um, and then the chylomicrons go into the lymphatic system. Remember one of the functions of the lymphatic system is to transport dietary lipids. They don't go directly into the blood, they go into the um, lymphatic system where they get processed through uh, structures within the lymphatic system to be able to dissolve into the plasma of the bloodstream and del be delivered to tissues throughout your body. Um, so they have a picture of that for lipids. I wish they had a picture showing how um, <coughs> carbohydrates and amino acids are absorb. Okay. It'd be nice, there's plenty of white space on the page right here to show two other pictures with all of that happening. Um, how that works for carbohydrates and um, uh, amino acids is actually fairly uh, straightforward. Now this table highlights um, how the various nutrient molecules are absorbed. For carbohydrates, they have listed the three simple sugars, glucose, galactose, and fructose. Glucose and galactose are both absorbed by co-transport with sodium ions. What that means is there's a concentration gradient for sodium across the uh, apical surface of the cell. 
And so sodium wants to get into the cell. The only way it can get into the cell is to bring somebody with it. And so there are co-transporters for glucose and galactose paired with sodium. Um, fructose, uh, which is different from the other two just in shape. Glucose and galactose are both six-sided ring structures. Fructose is a five-sided ring structure. So it's a uh, qualitatively different molecule. Um, it gets through the apical surface of the cells through facilitated diffusion, which means it's not uh, going to require any kind of energy to set up like a sodium concentration rate. And then amino acids, they say here, are also co-transported with sodium ions. When I was talking about that, I said the sodium ions coming into the cell have to bring something with them. And then I said like glucose and lactose. They can also bring amino acids. Now, um, I believe there are some amino acids that are co-transported with a different ion. And I can't remember now what ion that is. But, um, so it's not necessarily always a sodium ion. And it depends on the amino acid. There are 20 some odd different amino acids that are absorbed across your uh, intestinal line. So they don't all exactly transport the same way, but they're co-transported. And whatever it is, whether it's sodium or something else, energy is required to set up that concentration gradient to drive that movement. Um, and then lipids here, not a whole lot to say, they just diffuse through. Um, oh, one thing that is worth saying, uh, with the lipids, uh, the first two, they say diffusion into the cells, and then they're combined with proteins to create chylomicrons, which I mentioned earlier. Um, and then two of them, they just say simple diffusion. What's going on here is that not all dietary lipids actually have to be carried through the um, lymphatic system first. Just the long chain fatty acids, which are very hydrophobic, and uh, mono glycerins. They call them something slightly different there. I'm not a chemist. I'm just going to call it a monoglyceride. A fat molecule is a triglyceride. It's fatty acids attached to glycerol. Those fatty acids get taken off of the glycerol, but sometimes there's a glycerol and one fatty acid left over. That's a monoglyceride. Um, so whether it's a long chain fatty acid or a monoglyceride, those are big lipid molecules. And so they have to be combined with proteins to be my of microns and they go through the lymphatic system. Um, short chain fatty acids and glycerol, which is really more of a carbohydrate than a lipid by itself, um, they're just absorbed directly um, and they can uh, move directly into the plasma usually because they're not as hydrophobic as the really big lipids. Um, and then a little quirk there at the bottom, it says lipids, nucleic acids. Nucleic acids are not lipids, they just mislabel that row there. And nucleic acids aren't terribly important. They don't have a whole lot of nutritional value to us. They're a component of the food that we're eating, but not enough to make it onto a nutrition label, pretty like that. So I really kind of wish that with this picture here, they had two more panels, one showing um, six-sided uh, carbohydrate monosaccharides co-transported with uh, sodium ions and another one showing amino acids co-transported with sodium ions or some other ion uh, that they're paired with. But for whatever reason, they only show the lipid part, um, possibly because they're pointing out the fact that they get made into chylomicrons and they go into the lymphatic system. But, yeah. um, so, uh, and they just mentioned a couple other things that are absorbed. Um, I think, yeah, for here. This is just talking about um, where water comes from in our digestive system, whether we ingest it or it's a component of the various secretions, and then how we absorb it back, mostly through the small intestine and some through the large intestine, and very little water is lost in feces at the end of the system. So, um, <clears throat> I like to include with the digestive system also a little bit of information about nutrition because of the nutrient molecules <laughs> that we're taking in and uh, about metabolism, what we do with those nutrient molecules. Um, so I need to finish that up for this chapter, uh, which I'll get to on Thursday. Um, 
I was actually in the middle of recording that part, which is the last bit of the digestive system I need to record. I try to wrap it up at lunch, uh, and that should be posted pretty soon. Um, so you should have that information if you want to work on the um, assignments uh, attached to this chapter. But um, it's actually not from this chapter. The next chapter is about metabolism and nutrition. But there's very little out of that chapter that I'm pulling out. Um, and you don't have a separate set of assignments for that chapter. We're going to kind of skip over that chapter except for a couple of things I want to talk about. Um, so I'll do that at the beginning on Thursday, and then the rest of Thursday we'll start the uh, urinary system, which hopefully I'll be able to wrap up on Tuesday of the following week, and then we can use the rest of the semester to finish out the uh, reproductive system. So, um, so that's all I have for now. Uh, I'll let you out a little early, and uh, we'll pick it up next time.